Beethoven's Secret. 5 Secrets of Beethoven's Life and History You Probably Didn't Know About 1. Beethoven was almost a member of the controversial secret society known as the Illuminati. Beethoven's first serious mentor, and teacher was Christian Neef. A composer, writer, teacher, and dreamer. Was a member of the Freemasons and later the Illuminati. As an Illuminatus, an important part of Christian Neef's duty was to covertly inculcate promising young people in the ideals of the order, then to recruit them when they came of age. Beethoven was as promising as young people get. So did Neef inculcate this student? Surely he did. Was Beethoven recruited to the order? No. The Illuminati dissolved in 1785, when he was 14. Not only Neef, but then and later most of Beethoven's other friends and mentors and patrons were ex-Illuminati or Freemasons. Did those influences have an impact on his life and art? Among many other things, certainly. By the time Beethoven left Bonn, he was already planning to set Schiller's Ode to Music, and he had a good idea what that poem was about, from its humanistic surface to its Masonic and Illuminati depths. By then Bonn had helped give him ideas and ideals about being a composer that no one ever had before. He wanted to be something more than an entertainer. He wanted to be part of history. 2. Beethoven wrote a secret suicide letter to his brothers, I shall meet thee bravely. Ludwig van Beethoven was a rebel, a romantic, a revolutionary who struggled all of his life against poverty, injustice and ill health to produce genius art. His greatest struggle, however, was physical. When Beethoven realized he was going deaf he contemplated suicide. His deafness had started with severe tinnitus, a constant ringing in his ears, when he was only 26 years old. This was followed by gradual and then profound hearing loss by the time he turned 30. His deafness was an attack on his very being, his very existence, greatly impeding his ability to create. Unable to hear the notes he played, he would rest his head on the piano so he could feel their vibration. He therefore removed himself from society to a peaceful house in the countryside of Hilligenstadt, and it was here, that Beethoven wrote a final letter to his brothers Karl and Johann, in which he explained his wretched existence and his terrible sense of isolation and despair. After writing his testament, Beethoven decided against suicide, and hid the letter amongst his papers, where it was discovered after his death in 1827. Instead of death, Beethoven chose to accept his fate bravely, and focus on his art, and went on to compose some of his greatest works, during the last 15 years of his life. Beethoven's Hilligenstadt Testament is a deeply moving and highly personal letter, that is also a powerful reminder of the human will to succeed, no matter the obstacles or consequences. 3. Beethoven wrote a love letter to his immortal love, but no one knows who she was. Ever thine, ever mine, ever ours, Beethoven signed off the third letter and final letter to his immortal beloved with these very words. 1812, Beethoven wrote three love letters to an unnamed woman, whom he called Immortal Beloved. The apparently unsent letter was found in the composer's estate after his death. Since Beethoven neither specified a year nor a location, an exact dating of the letter and identification of the addressee was speculative until the 1950s, when an analysis of the paper's watermark yielded the year, and by extension the place. Scholars have since this time been divided on the intended recipient of the immortal beloved letter. The candidate favored by most contemporary scholars is Josephine Brunswick, an Austrian countess talented pianist, and probably the most important woman in Beethoven's life, as documented by at least 15 love letters he wrote her where he called her his only beloved, being eternally devoted to her and forever faithful. Other candidates who have been thought of and discussed by various mainstream scholars are, Julie, Giulietta, Gishirdi, an Austrian countess, briefly a piano student of Beethoven, and dedicatee of his famous piano sonata number 14, Moonlight Sonata, 
Barry Sprunswick Malfatti, an Austrian Baroness, cousin to the Julie Gishirdi, sister of Josephine Brunswick, a musician, and one of the supposed dedicatees of Beethoven's famous bagatelle, for Elise, Anna Maria Dotti, a countess, an excellent pianist, great friend and admirer to Beethoven, he lived with her for some time in 1808, dedicatee of Beethoven's Op. 70 and 102, and Bettina Brentano, Countess of Arnhem, a writer, publisher, composer, singer, visual artist, an illustrator, patron of young talent, and a social activist, Antony Brentano, a philanthropist, art collector, and arts patron, stepsister of Antony Brentano, and several others. 4. Beethoven and the Mystery of His Ninth Symphony, Unsolved Till Date The mysterious and unusual composition of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony has been time and again equated to the mysterious smile of da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I will not go into the details of the musical peculiarities that it contained, won't make much sense to anybody other than a composer himself. However, there are some easily understandable reasons why the Ninth Symphony was considered so remarkable. First, it was longer and more complex than any symphony to date and required a larger orchestra. Secondly, the most unique feature of the Ninth was that Beethoven included chorus and vocal soloists in the final movement, a first in the history of music. He was the first major composer to do this in a symphony. What is apparent is that, nobody has figured out what Beethoven meant by all this, the sweeping themes, the dissonance, the use of unusual orchestration, even the length, over an hour in length, it was much longer than most symphonies of his time. The result has been that every age and ideology has simply claimed the music for its own. It's been attached to European disunity in the form of nationalism, it got sucked into the Nazi cult of blood and race. And finally it became, with the joy theme's adoption as the anthem of the European Union, a symbol of togetherness. Others have seen the ninth as a universal human anthem. Paint it any color you like, and it remains its exalted and inexplicable self. If you want universality in a work of art, here you are. Five. Beethoven's cause of death remains a music's greatest mystery till date. As a storm raged outside his Vienna home in 1827, Ludwig van Beethoven, shrunken from illness and confined to his bed, had a final conversation with his maker. In a flash of lightning and a clap of thunder, he raised his fist and directed his famously glowering gaze at the heavens as if to say I defy you. And fell back dead. No. Hollywood didn't craft that scene. That's how a witness, composer Anselm Huttenbrenner, described Beethoven's death. Beethoven's cause of death has confused music lovers and scientists alike for more than 200 years. There have been all sorts of theories like alcohol poisoning, lead poisoning, syphilis, and hepatitis. But no one is ever completely certain. He was 57. The official cause of death was liver failure. What is true is that he had been sick on and off for years during his late life, with a particularly strong wave of sickness a year before his death. Beethoven had been so horrified at the effects of his mortal illness, bad breath, stomach swellings, that he actually requested that doctors did an autopsy on him to figure out what happened. This was to make sure no one else suffered like he did. Doctors performed the autopsy the day after he died. It turned out his liver was a shrunken mess after years of damage. This could have been from heavy drinking, or perhaps some kind of lead poisoning. One of his friends, Johann Hummel, saved a lock of his hair, and when 200 years later the energy department's Argonne National Laboratory analyzed these hair samples and other remains of his body, they discovered extremely high lead levels, 60 times more than what the human body can tolerate which of course suggests lead poisoning. This could explain Beethoven's constant nausea and headaches, and could have caused his death. Whether he drank from lead-lined cups, ate contaminated fish, or was given lead-based medical treatments we can but speculate. 